supported a workshop the day before yesterday and yesterday, which Uncle Bob led. Um, we've, uh, some, of you, some of you have had the privilege of, uh, of being in his presence uh, in the last couple of days and uh, learning more about his, uh, his practices. I think we're almost ready to go. Can we switch screens? Uncle Bob, everybody, Uncle Bob. Thank you. You have mic. Hi. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay, we're gonna try this with the microphone. Or I could do it like this, in the back. Now, all right, it's gonna be the microphone then. I want you to think about color, red, green, and blue. These are the colors on our screens. Why? Okay. Oh, oh. Hello. Why do we have three colors on our screens? Why are they red, green, and blue? Now, when I was growing up, the television sets that we had did not have red, green, and blue colors. When I was growing up, they were black and white. Although some people had color TVs, and the colors on the screen were magenta, cyan, and yellow, the opposites of red, green, and blue. So it does not have to be red, green, and blue. It could be some other colors, but it does need to be three. Why three? It is because your retina has three color receptors. Three different kinds of cells on the back of your eye that receive color. They do not receive red, green, and blue. Two of them are in the red spectrum, slightly separated. One of them is in the green spectrum, very far away from the others. And our brain senses these three different signals and turns them into color in our brains. Dogs have only two color receptors. They cannot see the same colors we do. And so for dogs, the color green may not mean very much. There are humans who have four. There aren't very many of us, but there are four. There are humans who have four color receptors on the back of their eye. They see more color than most of us. What do they see? I've seen demonstrations where someone will hold up two pieces of paper colored yellow. They look identical, but these people who have four receptors on their eyes will easily see the difference. And you ask them, well, what color are these? And they will say, well, that's the one yellow, and this is the other yellow. Because they can't tell the, they have no name for the color that they see. But of course, none of this is what we're supposed to be talking about. Oh, heavens, that was the wrong button to push. 
Good. Many, many years ago, in ancient societies, there was a class of people called scribes. These were the people who knew how to read and write. Most people didn't know how to read and write. Most people didn't care that they didn't know how to read and write. Reading and writing was not something that was necessary to their lives. But a few people, the scribes, they knew how to read and write. And they were highly valued by society because nothing could happen in society unless it was written down. Laws could not be passed unless they were written down. Rules could not be made unless they were written down. Business transactions could not be done unless they were written down. And so the scribes had a talent that most people did not have, and they were highly valued by society. They kept their talent to themselves, their ability to read and write. They kept it to themselves. They passed it from father to son and mother to daughter. They lived in a kind of separate society. They had their own uh, garb. They wore their own kinds of clothes. They uh, had secret handshakes. They um, had a, a, an entire society to themselves. Civilization could not function without them. And so they were able to make rules for themselves. For example, the scribes did not have to fight in wars. They could not be drafted. The scribes paid no taxes. I want to come back to this later. Scribes paying no taxes. Because we, programmers, are the modern day scribes. How many of you are programmers? What are the rest of you? <laughs> Those of you who are programmers have a special talent. You can read and write a language that most people cannot read and write. And society cannot function without you. This did not used to be true. It used to be that society could do fine without programmers. But that is no longer the case. Today, Society simply cannot function without you and I. Laws cannot be made. Transactions cannot be conducted. You cannot buy insurance. You cannot drive your car. You cannot cook in your microwave oven. You cannot wash your clothes. You can't watch TV. You cannot make a telephone call without us. You and I rule the world. Other people believe that they rule the world, but then they hand those rules to us. They hand those rules to us, and we write the rules that execute in the machines that drive our entire society. So let's look at a little history. I want to take you on a trip from the 1940s until today. When was the very first programmer? The very first programmer who wrote code in an electronic computer. Who was that person? When did that person live?
His name, of course, was Alan Turing. And in 1936, he wrote a paper. Who's read this paper? Ah, one person. This is the paper that defined what software is. In Alan Turing's paper, he invented the concept of software. He invented the notion of a machine that could follow instructions. He invented the subroutine. He invented the macro. He invented all of the things that you and I commonly use in this paper in 1936. He did not have a machine, but he had the concept. The machine came later. Let's go here, 1945. 1945, the very first electronic computer ever. The automated computing engine, the ACE. Alan Turing was the programmer of this machine. There were a few other people who programmed it as well. It had a 22-bit word. It had um, a cycle time of 100 microseconds. It was a very slow machine. It had to be programmed in binary. Who here has programmed in binary? Ah, look at that. Some of you. The rest of you are going, what? How could you program in binary? He had to program that in binary. There were no languages. There were no assemblers. There were no compilers. The only way to program that machine was to flip the bits on switches and load the program into the computer one word at a time in binary. The machine could not add. We should play games. The machine could not add. In order to add, he had to use logic, and, or, and not, to combine the bits to add two integers. The machine could not subtract. In order to subtract, he had to compute the two's complement of an integer and add. The machine could not multiply. In order to multiply, he had to write programs that added repeatedly in a clever way by shifting and adding. The machine could not divide. He had to write programs that divided by cleverly subtracting. And he wrote all these programs and he computed many things that he wanted to compute. And then he said something. He said, we shall need a great number of mathematicians of ability because there will probably be a good deal of this work of this kind to be done. How did he know? How did he know that there would be a great deal of work of this kind to be done? And did he know just how much work of this kind needed to be done?
Huh? How did he know? There certainly is now a great deal of this kind of work to be done. I don't think Alan Turing really knew what he was saying here. I don't think he understood just how right he was. But notice the first part here. Mathematicians of ability. Is that what you are? Are you mathematicians of ability? Is that how you look at yourself? It, it should be. If you are a programmer, you are undoubtedly a mathematician. And programming is hard. So if you are a programmer, you are a mathematician of ability. You should think of yourself that way. And then he said, one of our difficulties will be the maintenance of an appropriate discipline so that we do not lose track of what we are doing. Has anybody here lost track of what they were doing? You know what he was talking about here? And have you maintained the appropriate discipline? Can you name that discipline? Do you know what discipline you follow? Can you write it down? Can you tell me the steps in your discipline? Do you follow a discipline? Or do you just write code? Mathematicians of ability with appropriate discipline. That is what Alan Turing believed we had to be. Is that what we are? In 1946, the number of computers in the world was one. How many computers are in the world today? Can you count them? How many computers are in this room? Are there more computers in this room than there are people? in this room by a factor of five or ten. How many computers are you wearing on your body at the moment? One, two, three, four, five, six, Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven, twelve, thirteen. Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. How many computers are in the walls of this room? Obviously the screens. There are computers in those screens. But what about up there? What's that thing up there? Well, it's got to have a computer in it. One, two. Is there a sign back there? Look at that green sign back there. Glowing green, the exit sign. Does that have a computer in it? Well, it's got a battery. And the battery has to stay charged. Oh. 
And nowadays, in order for a battery to stay charged properly, it needs to be charged with a little computer that controls the amount of current that keeps the batteries charged. So very likely there's a little computer in that green sign back there. We are surrounded by computers, and every one of those computers is running software that we write. In 1945, the number of programmers in the world was one. How many programmers are there today? Wow, there are 600 in this room. But how many programmers are in the world today? Is it more than a million? More than 10 million? Could it be 100 million? It depends on if you count the VBA programmers, I suppose. but there could be a hundred million programmers in the world. How do you get from one 70 years ago to a hundred million today? What kind of growth curve is that? Is it linear? Can't be linear. It must be exponential. But an exponential growth curve has a doubling rate. So at what rate did the population of programmers have to double in order to go from one to a hundred million in 70 years? Now this is not difficult math. What is 100 million as a power of two? How many doublings does it take to get to a hundred million? And the answer to that is 27. You can do the math there. Two to the 20th is a million. Two to the seventh is 128. So two to the 27th would be about 100 million. How often would you have to do those 27 doublings? Well, you divide 70 by 27 and you get about two and a half. So the population of programmers must have doubled every two and a half years. Is the population of programmers doubling every two and a half years? Uh, probably not. Because in the early days, it probably doubled much faster. Alan Turing may have been the first programmer, but within a year, there were probably 30. Within two years, there were probably 200. So in the early years, it doubled much faster. Now it doubles less often. Let us say that the number of programmers in the world doubles every five years. And that's not, that's not unrealistic. That could be. Perhaps we are doubling every five years. If that's true, then half the programmers in the world have less than five years experience. And this will always be true as long as we are doubling every five years. Half the programmers in the world have less than five years experience. And this leaves us in a state of perpetual inexperience. You look around and you look at the programmers in the room, half of them have less than five years experience on average. How long does it take to become an experienced programmer? When can you say that you have put in the time to be experienced? Two years? Are you an experienced programmer after two years? Or are you still pretty much an idiot? I remember being a programmer after two years. I was an idiot. After five years, I knew some things. At five years, 
I knew a few things about programming. I was still an idiot. After 10 years, I knew a lot. I knew a lot about software after 10 years. I don't think I was an idiot. I was just kind of ignorant. 15 years, most of the ignorance was gone. Although, having been a programmer for 20 years, I was still writing 3,000 line C functions. So, not that good. 25 years, probably you're pretty experienced by 25 years. Probably even at 20 years, you're probably pretty experienced. At five years, hmm, probably not so much. So our group of programmers is always inexperienced. How do we train them? How do we teach them? How can we improve the experience level of our industry if we are doubling every five years? Well, those of us who are older, those of us who do have experience, have a responsibility to teach. And who would we teach? Well, we'd better teach the new programmers coming in. That would be a good idea. But there are other people who need to be taught. How many scrum masters do we have in the room here? Scrum masters, right? Oh, goody, goody. We've got a few people who went to a class for two days and paid a lot of money and got a piece of paper. Excellent. Good. How many product owners do we have here in the room? Oh, we got a product owner or two. Excellent. How many project managers do we have here in the room? Oh, we've got project managers. Good. The number of you folks must double at the same rate as the number of programmers because the size of programming teams remains roughly the same. So the number of scrum masters in the world must be doubling every five years. The number of project managers in the world must be doubling every five years. Product owners must be doubling every five years. And you guys need to be taught as well. I'm not going to talk about core memory or any of that stuff. I want to get to other things. Oh, yeah, that's me. Yes, 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 all of this stuff, how interesting, good, 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 lovely, wonderful. I'm not going to talk about it. And oh, hey, you know what this was? That's the room where the Agile Manifesto was created. I went back there about three years ago, and I took this picture. Same room, same place. I even wrote the Agile Manifesto on the board so that it kind of looked like it looked back in 2001. I don't know why I showed you that. I just thought it was a cool picture. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff right now, although it would be interesting. I think I'm going to talk about something else. How much code is in a modern car? An automobile. How much code runs in that car? A modern car, and we're not talking about a Tesla here. A modern car has a hundred million lines of code in it. hundred million. Most of that is in the GPS system and the entertainment system and so forth. But some of that code controls the engine. 
some of that code controls the brake. When you put your foot on the accelerator in a modern car, you may think that you are pulling on a little cable that turns a valve in the carburetor to allow fuel to go into the engine. You are not. When you put your foot on the accelerator pedal in a car, nowadays, you are instructing a computer to change the fuel flow into the car, into the engine. And that computer has software written in it, and that software has if statements in it that decide whether or not to follow your instructions. It is entirely possible that you will put your foot on the accelerator and the car will decide to ignore you, depending on the skill of the programmer who wrote that code. When you put your foot on the brake, you might like to think that you are pushing on a piston that controls the hydraulics that squeeze the calipers on the wheels, but you are not. You are instructing a computer to decide whether or not to obey your instructions. Think very carefully about this because you know. The code inside those computers might fail. And you and I understand how code fails. How many people have been killed by the software in their car? How many people have been killed because the software in their car failed for reasons that you and I would understand? And the answer to that is several dozen people have been killed by the software in their car. Some of them horribly. Imagine a car that decides to accelerate without control. The brake has no meaning anymore. The car just runs as fast as it can until you hit a tree. And imagine that that is a software fault. Those software faults have happened. You and I are killing people. We did not get into this business to kill people. You and I got into this business because we printed our name in an infinite loop and it was just so cool. But now, we are killing people. Who has heard the story of Knight Capital? $450 million lost in 45 minutes because of a very silly software bug. And they could not shut that machine off fast enough. The CEO of that company woke up the next morning without a company. He just had it sold out from underneath him because a couple of software developers made a stupid mistake. $450 million gone. What? did the programmers at Volkswagen do? They wrote code that detected if they were on an environmental testing stand and they changed the engine parameters to reduce emissions by a factor of 20. They cheated. When they were not on an environmental testing stand, they changed the engine parameters to emit 20 times the number of pollutants that they were allowed. Why did these programmers do that? Who told them to do it? Why did they obey? Those programmers are going to jail. The courts have already decided that the programmers are guilty of a crime. They are going to jail. So are their bosses. Did anybody see the CEO of Volkswagen North America testifying before Congress, the Congress of the United States, 
And the senators asked him, how could you have let this happen? How could you have cheated? And he said, and I quote, it was just a few software developers who did this for whatever reason. You and I have now been blamed by our bosses. There will come a day, and it's not probably very far away, when one of us will do something stupid and 10,000 people will die. And when this happens, and you know it will, 10,000 people will be killed by some silly software mistake, and you can imagine what it might be. And when this occurs, the politicians of the world will rise up in righteous indignation and they will point our fingers at us. Not at our bosses, not at our companies. The CEO of Volkswagen North America showed us what was going to happen. The finger will point at you and I, and the question will be asked, how could you have let this happen? And our answer had better not be, well, you know, we, we just had to make the date. It had to be done by Tuesday. That had better not be our, our response. Because if that is our answer, then the politicians of the world will do the thing they must do. They will legislate. They will pass laws. They will instruct us what languages we can use, what processes we have to follow, what signatures we have to obtain what platforms are allowable, and we will become workers for the government. I would very much like to avoid this. And so, when this happens, and it will, when the governments of the world point their finger at you and I and ask us, how could you have let this happen? I want there to be an answer. And the answer I want is, this was an accident, it was not due to our negligence. We can prove this because here are the disciplines we follow. And we cannot say that today because we do not follow very many disciplines. So what disciplines? I submit for your consumption a set of promises, promises that you as programmers can put into an oath. And the first of those promises is very simple. I will not produce harmful code. Now, the, the folks at Volkswagen created harmful code. That's very clear. But what does harmful code mean? Harmful code means code that harms your user, code that harms your company, code that harms your fellow programmer. How can you harm your fellow programmer with code? By writing code that your fellow programmer cannot understand, cannot maintain. How can you harm your company with your code? By writing code that your company cannot change takes years to manipulate. How can you harm your users by producing code that does not function properly, that crashes once every month? That is harmful code. And you should promise not to produce harmful code. It's a very reasonable promise. Any, anyone who employed your service would expect you to make that promise. Two, the code that I produce will always be my best work. Has anybody here released code that was not their best work? I would like you to promise never to do that again. I want you to promise that the code that you produce will always be 
the best code that you can produce, your best work. You owe this to your employer. You owe this to your users. You owe this to yourself. You owe this to the world. The code you produce should be your best work. And don't talk to me about schedules. Don't tell me, oh, we can't produce our best work because we've got to meet the schedule. There's an old rule in software. I can meet any schedule you set for me if the code doesn't have to work. Name the date, I will meet the date so long as the code does not have to work. I don't want you following that rule. The code should be your best work, regardless of the schedule. And it is perfectly fair to inform your employer that the schedule cannot be met because you can't meet it. What happens when a, a manager tells you it must be done by Tuesday? Do you get it done by Tuesday? Or maybe Wednesday? What would happen if the manager said, this must be done by Tuesday, and you said, OK, then you have made a promise. Are you going to keep that promise? You should never make a promise like that, unless you are certain that you can keep that promise. Never make a promise unless you can keep that promise. Never commit to a date unless you know you can make that date. And do not ever be fooled by the word try. Managers will come to you and say, well, will you at least try? And the answer to that is no. I will not try. I am already trying. How dare you imply that I am not trying? D uh, you might not want to say it that way. But that should be your attitude. I am already trying. There is nothing more I can do. This date cannot be met. I will not knowingly allow code that is defective either in behavior or structure to accumulate. It's not that you won't write it, because you will, but you will not allow it to accumulate. You will clean the code, keep the code from accumulating defects in behavior and structure. Three, I will produce with each release a quick, sure, and repeatable proof that every element of the code works as it should. This is a perfectly reasonable promise to make. It is a perfectly reasonable promise for your employer and your users to demand. You should be able to prove that the code you wrote works. And you should be able to prove it quickly. And if they ask you to prove it over and over, you should be able to prove it over and over. If seven different people come into the room and say, OK, prove it to me again, you should be able to do it. And that proof should be believable. And that proof should be unambiguous. Obviously, I'm talking about tests, aren't I? Obviously, I'm talking about a suite of tests. I am talking about the work that you must do as a professional to demonstrate that what you have written will actually function. How many of you have released code, shipped it to users, and you weren't quite sure if it would work? You know, well, I kind of hope it'll work. It sort of worked in the lab. I saw it work once. That is not proof, and that is not professional. That is, in fact, immoral. Four. I will make frequent small releases so that I do not impede the progress of others. You will work in small steps. You promise to work in small steps. You are not going to check the code out and keep it for a month. 
You are going to check the code out, make a small change, check the code back in. You are not going to release the software to production once every 10 years. You will release to production frequently. You will take small steps because the small steps are the only ones that you can prove correct. The small steps are the only ones that are safe to take. Do not take big steps that take a long time. Take small steps that take a small time. Thank you. Five. I will fearlessly and relentlessly improve the work at every opportunity. I will never allow it to degrade. How many of you are working on a software system that has degraded? It started well, but now it's terrible. It has gotten worse and worse with time. Humans do not make things worse with time. Humans make things better with time. Professionals make things better with time. You will relentlessly and fearlessly improve your work at every opportunity. Six. I will do all that I can to keep the productivity of myself and others as high as possible. I will do nothing that decreases that productivity. I want you to go fast. Everybody wants you to go fast. So don't do anything that slows you down. Does anybody here have a test suite that runs for hours? Why would you have a test suite that runs for hours? Design that test suite better so that it runs in minutes. The fact that the test suite runs for hours slows you down. Does anyone here still in 2017 have a build cycle that runs for hours? Slow that, speed that build cycle up. Don't allow something long like that to exist any longer. Seven. I will continuously ensure that others can cover for me and that I can cover for them. We talk about ourselves as a team. We like to think of, you know, the software team. The team is going to do this. The team is going to do that. Now imagine a team of players on the field moving the ball down the field. One of them goes down. What do the other players do? They don't stop. They cover the hole. They cover for the man who went down. They keep the ball going down the field. That is how a team behaves. Now imagine a group of software developers, a team of software developers. Are they all sitting in cubicles, facing the wall, wearing headphones? Or are they talking to each other? Are they programming with each other? Do they sit around a table and interact with each other? How many of you pair program? Program in pairs. Notice the rest of you. How can you cover for your teammates if you are not programming with them? How can you cover for your teammates if you don't know where their code is or what they've been doing? How can you be a team if you cannot cover for each other? Eight. I will produce estimates that are honest, both in magnitude and precision. I will not make promises without certainty. What is the most accurate estimate you can make? I don't know. That is the most accurate estimate you can make. It is honest because you don't know. It is accurate. Well, it's actually not very accurate because it has no, no, no estimate in it at all. So you're probably going to have to say something a little bit better than I don't know. What can you say? You can say, well, 
if everything goes perfectly, I can get this done in five days. If things go as they usually do, it'll take me 10 days. And if, if things go really, really bad, it's going to take me 20 days. You can say that. And your boss probably won't like that. Your boss will say, just give me a date. No, I cannot give you a date because I don't know the date. I can't promise a date. I can tell you the range. I can tell you how much I don't know. And that would be an honest estimate. And you are thinking right now, many of you, my boss will never tolerate that. Well, that's just too bad for your boss. Because the only other alternative is for you to lie. If you say, well, all right, I'll get it done by, you know, next Wednesday, you are lying. Because you don't know you're going to get it done by next Wednesday. You have a, an obligation to tell the truth. Your managers need to know how uncertain you are. They need to take that into account. They need to manage that. So you must never give a date unless you are certain of that date. Last one. Nine. I will never stop learning and improving my craft. Software development is not a job. Being a programmer is not a job. It is a career. It is a profession. Professions are not nine to five. They are not 40 hours. You, when you become an employee, make a promise to your employer to give them 40 hours a week. Or maybe it's some other number in your country. I don't know. But you, you promise a certain number of hours per week. That number of hours is not sufficient for you to keep your career alive. You must, when you go home, put another few hours in. On the weekends, you might want to put a few hours in. On the evenings, you might want to put a few hours in. Not on your employer's work, but on the work that you need to do to keep your skills sharp. You need to learn new languages. How many are Java programmers? You see the Java people. Oh, yeah. Good. Uh, .NET. Oh, yeah. Good. C. Look at that. C programmers. Yes. C++. Oh, Ruby. Good. Python. Whoa, closure. Mm, okay. F sharp. Scala. All these languages will be dead in 20 years. All right? Do not sit on those languages and think that you have a career in those languages. You'd better be learning the new ones that are coming along. And you better get appropriate knowledge for them because your employer will suddenly decide one day we're switching to Gazuga and you better know that language because if you don't they're gonna hire people who do and then you'll be stuck maintaining the old Java code for the next 50 years always learn always improve and with that I have come to the end of my talk to you Thank you all for your attention. I appreciate it. I'll see you around the conference. So, so I'd like to take a couple of questions. Um, this is a microphone here. Uncle Bob, thank you for that, that amazing talk. Um, let's, let's open up for, I think we can take two or three questions. This is your one opportunity to, I need to be aware of the speaker. Yeah? So, raise your hand up high, who wants, to make a who wants to pose a question? There we go. Just over there. Give close one up. Pass it along, please. Thank you. Hi. Um, just a question. Um, would your definition of harmful code correspond to Volkswagen's code for tricking the emissions test if they hadn't been caught? 
Say this again very slowly. Right. Would your definition of harmful code correspond to Volkswagen's code for tricking the emissions test if they hadn't been caught? Okay, let's try this again. Okay. Would your definition of harmful code correspond to Volkswagen's code for tricking the emissions test if they hadn't been caught? If they hadn't been caught? Yeah. <laughs> All right, now let me repeat this question for you. Um, would my definition of harmful code include the code that the Volkswagen programmers wrote if they hadn't been caught? Yes. Is there any question about that? Listen, if you write code that cheats and you know you are writing code that cheats, you should not be a programmer the rest of the programmers in the world should point their fingers at you and say, get out, because you are dishonoring us. Sorry, I didn't mean to point my finger at you. Right. A good enough answer? Oh, you want to elaborate on this? Great discussion about to happen. Yeah, so okay, yes. Harmful could you repeat the question on the bottom? general public would count. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and by the way, it was harmful for Volkswagen, too. What was the settlement there? How many billions of dollars did they have to pay and their executives go to jail? And that was harmful for Volkswagen. Another one? Another question. Yep. I'm just going to go to that one and then to you, okay? Where are we? Yes. Given that we are already more than a hundred million. Yes. And given that the tribe kept the cash to themselves. Yes. While we do the opposite. Does <laughs> this differ to your view? So, excellent question. I said that programmers double every five years, and we already have a hundred million programmers. And remember that scribes kept the number limited. Why don't we keep the number limited? What an interesting question. Should we? Should the, the programmers in the world decide that there's only a certain number of programmers that the world can tolerate? Well, that sounds kind of interesting, actually. I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but uh, maybe what we do is raise the standards. You can't be a programmer until you meet these standards. That would have the effect of limiting the number. Are you familiar with the no estimates movement? Yes. And, and have you seen it applied successfully in successful businesses? No. <laughs> Good enough. I think we had one over here. Yeah. So you talk about a world where programmers are ethical, right? Yes. And moral. What is it? that makes programmers be ethical? Because as far as I know, in the rest of the world, there's a lot of other professions where you know, ethics doesn't exist. Why programmers? I talk about the fact that programmers should be ethical. What is it that would force programmers to be ethical? Because certainly there are other professions in the world where ethics is not followed. But there are professions in which ethics is a part of the profession. Uh, doctors, for example, can be thrown out of their profession by other doctors if the, if the ethics is violated. Lawyers can be thrown out of their profession by other lawyers. And we, as a body of programmers, should be able to do the same thing. We don't have, at this point, the necessary organization to do that. But that organization will have to come. Programmers. I am describing a guild, I am describing a board, uh, I am describing a, an organization into which programmers would pay dues 
an organization that would license the programmers and an organization that had the means to enforce the promises that I just put up there, if those are the promises that eventually get enforced. So Uncle Bob, given that, how do you see the future of Agile? The future of Agile? A very different question. So the problem that has occurred within Agile, I call the, the um, takeover by the project managers. Agile was started by programmers, for programmers. And for the first few years, it served that well. Kent Beck at the Snowbird meeting said, Agile is here to heal the divide between business and development. But then along came the certified Scrum Master course. And although it did us a great service, it brought Agile into the mainstream, it also invited a very large number of non-programmers into the Agile community. That in itself is not bad. We need non-programmers in the Agile community. But the numbers were overwhelming. And the project managers who came in had a different agenda than the original programmers. And they pretty well took over. And the programmers left. They went away. If you go to Agile conferences in the United States, for example, you will find that they are dominated almost entirely by project managers. The number of technical talks has diminished down to almost zero. The programmers just went somewhere else. It did not heal the divide. The programmers left. What has to happen in the Agile movement is a healing of that rift. We have to somehow bring the programmers and the project managers and all of these people back together so that they can operate properly as a team. Sandra is going to do a talk on, so on software craftsmanship shortly. That is one of the efforts to try and bring these two bodies back together. That's what's going to happen. That has to be the future of Agile. If that is the future of Agile, then the organization that I was talking about that would enforce professionalism could arise from the Agile community. As the Agile community currently stands, that is not possible. Thank you very, very much for that uh, fantastic opening. Dear friends,